Hi, I see lots of friends and I see some new folks. Hi, Jane. Um, I see some new folks. So welcome everyone. Hi, Leslie Ann, I'm glad you made it. Um, we are going to get started. I have so much to talk about. I literally could talk about any one of these aspects of constipation for an hour. <laughs> so to make sure I don't do that, I have a little list and the title of my list, you can't see, it's called, this is my list to keep me moving, pun intended, right? So here's the deal, getting regular, constipation. This is literally my favorite thing to treat. And I love my inflammatory bowel disease patients, my patients with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, but, um, and those are chronic diseases. But the thing I love about constipation is that somebody comes in, I roll up my sleeves, medical detective, we get to work. And ideally in a couple of visits, problem solved. So I love that this has a beginning, middle and an end. So the first thing I wanna tell you or remind you is that constipation is not a disease unto itself. It is a symptom. And it is a symptom that always has a cause and often multiple causes, right? And so this is what I want you to get out of this hour is how you can go backwards, follow the breadcrumbs backwards, roll up your sleeves and figure out your constipation and treat it. Because although I'm gonna talk about some remedies, I don't want to put a band-aid on your constipation. I want to solve your constipation so that you're not constipated and bloated anymore. And that so that you're a well-oiled machine and you're just having a beautiful, magnificent stool nirvana poop every morning and you feel fantastic. Okay. So let us talk about the definition of constipation. The textbook definition is three or fewer bowel movements per week. So three or less than three bowel movements per week. But the fact of the matter is that you can have a bowel movement every single day and still be constipated because the new constipation is incomplete evacuation. Just like you guys know about the new insomnia, the new insomnia, it's not that people can't fall asleep, it's that they can't stay asleep. So people typically are exhausted, they fall asleep as soon as their head hits a pillow, but the problem is they wake up at three or 4 a.m. and they can't go back to sleep. So same thing with constipation. People are not in a situation necessarily where they cannot have a bowel movement. They're having a bowel movement, but it's incomplete. It is a small, stingy Western stool. And I don't that mean that as a slur to people living in the Western hemisphere, but it is a fact that because of our diets that are traditionally much lower in fiber than say parts of Southeast Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa, we tend to have very small, hard stools and tend to be constipated. So in Sub-Saharan Africa, where people are eating 60, 70, 80 grams of fiber, and of course it depends, right? Are we talking about rural areas or urban areas? So in more rural areas, like let's take a place like Burkina Faso, Bull Pond, Burkina Faso. People there practice the same kind of subsistence farming that their ancestors did. And so they're eating massive amounts of root vegetables that are all grown typically right locally in their compound, 60, 70, 80 grams of fiber a day. They're eating an occasional piece of free range chicken, an occasional termite during the rainy season for animal protein. And other than that, it's all really this sort of ultimate whole foods plant-based diet. And what's happening in their gut? Well, they're having stools literally the size of my head one or two times a day. And they're having something else. And, you know, let me just warn you, like we get into it here, right? There's nothing gross about any of this stuff. So they have what I like to call the clean wipe. The clean wipe is very rare in America and other more developed countries because we're not eating 60, 70, 80 grams of, of root vegetables. The clean wipe means that when you go, you have a bowel movement, you wipe your bottom, and there's nothing on the toilet paper. Because why? Because you've had a complete evacuation. So when you've had a complete evacuation, the entire bowel movement falls into the toilet and there's no messy cleanup after. So this is one of the first things that I ask my patients is I ask them, when you wipe, how many wipes, how many sort of passes of toilet paper are you doing to clean up. And if you are having schmary stool where you wipe and wipe and wipe and you're still, you know, the toilet paper still has stool on it, that is likely a sign of incomplete evacuation and a sign that your colon is not emptying completely. So to circle back, we took a detour to Burkina Faso. Let's detour back 
and talk about the definition again. So fewer than three bowel movements a day, a week, typically, as well as we also factor in consistency when we're talking about constipation, okay? So is your stool hard and small and difficult to pass? That counts as constipation also, uh, the consistency, and then also the size, right? Is it hard? Is it small? Is it difficult to pass? And is it fewer than three per week? But again, the caveat, you can be going every day and still be constipated. So let's get right to causes. I like to divide the causes up. You know I'm going to start with the medicine cabinet, right? The menace cabinet. You know that is, that is the first thing I want you to think about. Are you taking something that is causing you to become constipated? Because our natural state, when we are eating a reasonable diet, moving our bodies a little bit, getting some water, take a sip in, in honor of moving, our natural state is to be eliminating magnificently. And every day, you eat every day, you should eliminate every day. So when we think about the medicine cabinet, we think about, I mean, there are some obvious things, right? So narcotics or anything with a narcotic in it, that could even mean a cold, um, you know, sort of cough and cold medication that has codeine in it. So anything that has any sort of pain relief narcotic is going to dramatically slow your bowels down. And again, cough medicine, cough syrup with codeine, that's a classic one. Vitamins, particularly anything that has iron in it is another one. Antacids that contain aluminum salts, they're very binding. So you may be taking Tums for your reflux, not realizing it's causing constipation and your constipation is making your reflux worse. So really important to keep that in mind. Calcium, so I know lots of people take a magnesium calcium combination. The magnesium is great for laxation, which is a nice way of saying having a bowel movement, but the calcium is not so good for laxation. So if you're taking a calcium magnesium supplement, you may actually be working, you know, magnesium helping, calcium hurting. And in that sense, you're really not achieving anything in terms of laxation. So think about the calcium as well as calcium channel blockers, which are common medications that are used for high blood pressure. Um, let's see, did I miss anything with, I made a little list. Um, narcotics, vitamins, iron, calcium, aluminum containing antacids, antidepressants, another huge, huge um, category. Hi, Sydney. Another really big, my daughter just slinked upstairs. Another big category um, are the antidepressants and many different kinds, SSRIs, et cetera, can cause constipation. Sometimes it's just the first two or three weeks when you're taking it and it levels off, but often it can cause more chronic constipation. And so some things to think about might be a lower dose, switching to a different agent, or you know, even talking to the person who's prescribing it about whether cognitive behavioral therapy or some other non-pharmaceutical option might be the best option for you. So that's really something I want you to think about, prescription, over-the-counter, as well as supplements for constipation. Another big category, obviously I touched on it a minute ago, is diet. Are you getting in, I mean, we recommend in the US, you know, somewhere between 25 to 35 grams of fiber, but the truth is you should really be aiming for about 40 to 50 grams. And the most important thing here is that should be on processed fiber. So what do I mean by that? The simplest way to think about it is if the fiber is coming out of a box, a package, a bag, if the substance containing the fiber has an ingredient list printed on it, if it were, is coming out of a factory, it's processed. Lentil chips, processed. Um, applesauce, processed. Brown rice pasta, processed. Versus the actual lentils that you're buying in bulk, an actual apple that you would eat, sweet potato, unprocessed sweet potato chips, processed. So think about unprocessed fiber and a combination. Leafy greens are fantastic, but they're not necessarily a high fiber food. So for the high fiber vegetables, think about things like asparagus, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, broccoli, green beans. And when you cook those vegetables, try and incorporate as much of the stems as possible because that's where most of the fiber is. So we talked about medicine cabinet. We talked about diet. There are systemic conditions, meaning conditions that affect your entire body. And the classic two that would cause constipation are diabetes and hypothyroidism and underactive thyroid. And overactive thyroid actually causes the opposite problem too fast. So how does diabetes cause constipation? Well, it affects the nerves that are involved in emptying and transit through the GI tract. So that's one common way it can affect the, the nerves in the stomach, 
disproportionately and you end up with something called gastroparesis. We'll talk about that another time, but it can slow down transit in general through the GI tract. Same with hypothyroidism. Other hormonal issues, so menopause and perimenopause is a classic time for women to get constipated. When I see a menopausal or perimenopausal woman in my office and she tells me, I don't understand what's going on. I'm constipated and I'm not doing anything differently. I will often say, that's why you're constipated because your body is different, but you're not doing anything differently. So you have to ramp up the fiber. You have to increase movement. You have to increase the hydration. You have to do things differently because there's a natural slowing down of motility with menopause. Uh, hormonal, let's see, what else do I want to talk about? Okay. Um, let's talk about some anatomical problems. Oh, stimulant laxatives. So stimulant laxatives work by just what they sound right, like, right? They stimulate the bowel, but you can become and will become, if you use them for long enough, dependent on stimulant laxatives and your bowel needs more and more and more stimulation to work. So if you've been using stimulant laxatives like Dulcolax over a long period of time, over time, you can develop something we call colonic inertia, where your colon doesn't contract because it has now become resistant and you're not on a high enough dose. So, you know, we think about laxatives are both the cause of diarrhea as well as a cause of constipation. Um, I want to talk about the voluptuous venous colon. Like I said, I have so much to talk about here. I literally have to make sure I cross things off my list as I go through them. Okay, so let us talk about one of my favorite things of voluptuous venous colon. Women have a completely different gastrointestinal tract from men. So I'm sorry for, for all my male friends who are on the call. I just have to digress a little bit and talk about women. In Women have a longer colon, on average about 10 centimeters longer. And that may not seem like a lot, that's only about four and a half inches, but here's the deal. That extra length of the colon is in the sigmoid colon and it creates redundancy, meaning it creates like extra loops. And those extra loops mean that the stool can get stuck along the way. Now, why is a colon longer in women? Well, we're not 100% sure, but we think that it has to do with the ability to absorb more fluid from the colon into the bloodstream to maintain the amniotic fluid during pregnancy. And we think this is why from an evolutionary point of view, we have longer colons. But again, for the practical purposes, it means, you know, you'll, they'll often show in a textbook, the sigmoid colon is this beautiful S shape. The truth is it looks like this. It's like a slinky. And in women, it's really slinked around. Why? Not only is it longer, but in women, in the pelvis, we have the reproductive organs. So we have the uterus, we have the fallopian tubes, we have the ovaries. Men just have a little bitty prostate gland and all this extra hardware in the pelvis means that the colon in woman has to compete for space. It has to go around all of these different organs. So number one, longer colon. Number two, reproductive organs kind of in the way. Number three, women have a wider, deeper pelvis. Men have what's called an android pelvis, more like a rectangle. Women have a deep gynecoid pelvis, wider again to allow for extra space during childbirth and, and pregnancy. And what this wider pelvis means is that in women, our colon drops deep down into the pelvis, where again, it has to compete for space with the reproductive organs. In men, most of their colon is up, higher up in the abdomen, not in the pelvis, and there's more room there. And then finally, this is a hormonal difference. As women, we have lower levels of testosterone. Remember, we have testosterone, just not as much as men. And the fact that we have lower levels of testosterone means that we have a less well-developed abdominal wall, right? Our Spanx, that tight abdominal wall that holds our colon in is a little looser. And so even in men, and I've said this before, even in men who have a big bare belly, underneath that bare belly, they have a tighter abdominal wall typically just because of the testosterone levels. And so their colon is not as prone to looping and bulging out and stuff doesn't get stuck in the different corners. So I'll tell you, I do a lot of colonoscopy. I've probably done about 16 or 17,000 colonoscopies in my 30 year career. And I will tell you that it takes me on average about twice as long, maybe three times as long to do a colonoscopy in a woman compared to a man. And slim women are very challenging. I mean, it's, it's the only time it's, it's not good to be, uh, to be at your ideal weight. Um, and that's because typically they don't have as um, much abdominal heft that's kind of buttressing the colon in and there's 
the so when you're doing the colonoscopy, you're more prone to the bowel looping and so on. So these are some of the reasons. Again, longer colon, wider deeper pelvis, reproductive organs, and lower testosterone levels, more stretched out spanks holding everything in. Why women are more prone to constipation and bloating. Okay, let's let's get back to some more equal opportunity employers in terms of causes of constipation. I'm going to talk sort of nonstop for the first half hour, and then I'm going to literally stop and have you ask all your questions, but I want to make sure we get all through, through all of this stuff. So let's talk about holding. It is when you have that, that signal to have a bowel movement, the worst thing that you can do is to not heat it. Why? Because you are reverse training your bowels, what they're supposed to do. So when you get that urge, you are supposed to get the to the closest bathroom and have a bowel movement. And ideally as quickly as possible, not with this, okay? I don't know if he's um, if he's on, but my husband's working from home today and he said he was gonna sign on for this. He hasn't attended any before. I have to check the names and see if he's on. He's in a different, different room. And I'll tell you that I give him only an A minus. He is a champion pooper in general, early, you know, 5.45, 6 a.m. But the problem is he takes this in with him. He takes a phone. So he's in there forever. And I know he's done. This is terrible because what this does is it tells, and what I just mean your phone, your book, anything like that. It tells your bowel, take your time. We've got all day. We're just halfway through the news feed, right? Take your time. So you want to, it's biofeedback. You are actually training your bowel movement every time you go in there. You're training your bowels, rather, every time you go in to have a bowel movement. And you want to make sure you're giving the feedback that, you know, time is of the essence. So you literally want to sit down. Even if you don't necessarily feel the urge, you want to try and, you know, give a little push and then stop. Give a little push again. If nothing's happening, you can come back. But you do not want to sit in there all day long. I want to, it's really hard to talk about constipation without mentioning even briefly the mechanics of constipation. And this is, you know, stuff that people don't necessarily want to talk about, but it's really critically important you understand how it works. Because the next thing I'm going to talk about is stress and how that constipates you. And once you understand what's going on neuromuscularly, it's going to be a light bulb for you, I promise. Okay, so there are three sets of muscles you need to know about the internal anal sphincter, the external anal sphincter, and the puborectalis muscle, okay? Let's start with the internal sphincter, which I'm just gonna call the internal sphincter or the IAS, internal anal sphincter. The internal sphincter is under involuntary control, kind of like your heart rate or your blood pressure. I can't sit here and make my heart rate go up or go down. I mean, I probably could if I meditated and worked at it, but, but typically my heart rate is something that is under involuntary control. It's related to my stress levels, my hydration levels, my cardiovascular status, et cetera. And that's different from your external sphincter, the EAS, the external sphincter is under voluntary control. I can move that like I move my hands around, okay? The internal sphincter is normally in a contracted state. It is contracted tight. Why? To keep you from pulling your pants, literally, right? To keep your stool from coming out. So it is contracted. And in order to have a bowel movement, it has to relax to let the stool out. The external sphincter is opposite. The external sphincter has to contract to push. And remember, I told you the external sphincter is the voluntary one, the one you think about and you think, yes, now is a good time to have a bowel movement. So what happens is the rectum, which is your reservoir, the very end of the colon where the stool is stored, about six inches long, the rectum normally can sense stool in it at about 20 milliliters of stool, which is not a lot. That's when most people can feel there's something. But guess what? It can expand up to about 400 milliliters of stool, right? So it can expand to 20 times that capacity if I did the math right. Yeah, 20 times 20, okay? So you can, that can, nor, under normal conditions, the rectum is very distensible, like a balloon, and it can expand, 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 expand to 20 times its capacity until, you know, you're in trouble, right? You got to get to the bathroom. Don't wait that long. So here's the thing. 
once the rectum starts to fill up past that 20 ml threshold, as it fills, it gets to sort of a critical point where these, these sensors in the muscle basically tell the internal involuntary sphincter to relax so that the stool can start to exit. And then you voluntarily tell your external sphincter, okay, time to press now. And, and one other thing happens, the puborectalis muscle is like a sling and it's normally in its resting state at like a 90 degree angle. And as you get into a good position for having a bowel movement, which ideally is a squat, not a sit, that angle straightens up so the stool can shoot straight out. Okay, so that 90 degree angle just like the internal sphincter being contracted is designed to protect you from pooing your pants. So as you squat or, you know, get it, you start to use the abdominal muscles, the, that puborectalis angle straightens and the stool can come right out. So three things have to happen. The internal sphincter has to relax, the external sphincter has to contract, and the puborectalis has to straighten out. And I haven't even got into what's going on with the abdominal muscles, the diaphragm, et cetera. But understand that if you are stressed, what's likely to happen? That internal sphincter is not going to relax. It's gonna be clenched tight, just like the rest of you, right? So you really have to think about the relaxation response that needs to happen ideally to have a good bowel movement and then abdominal muscles, which is why people who are in really bad shape or people in nursing homes often have trouble with constipation. They can't generate enough intra-abdominal pressure to push that bowel movement out. And then of course the squatting. Um, some of you may know about the squatty potty. I, I have a, you can use telephone directories because there's no reason you would need a telephone directory other than to put your feet up on them. So anything that gets you into more of a squatting position, I actually put my feet up on the toilet seat because I'm a little bit flexible that way, but you want to be careful. You don't want to tip over, but if you can bring your feet right up onto the toilet seat, that will create a nice angle. You're trying to decrease the angle between your thighs and your abdomen. So you're trying to basically bring your knees up like this to increase intra-abdominal pressure. And so if you're having trouble, especially if you're having trouble with incomplete evacuation, three simple things that I want you to try. I want you to increase the amount of fiber you're eating, like add a sweet potato in for dinner every night, add some chickpeas to your salad, you know, do an extra cup of broccoli, really try to get the fiber in, number one. Hydrate, this bottle is 40 ounces. So I try to get at least two of them in every day. And I'll tell you, if I wasn't measuring it, I probably wouldn't drink half of this because I'm not even thirsty. So I have to force myself. And I, you know, I try and keep it in my car at the end of the day, I, I look and see, but two and a half of these is hundred ounces, which is my goal. And I have to say, I don't usually reach that, but I try and do two 80 ounces. So you have to measure it, take a sip. So um, eat more fiber, drink more water, and then try and think about the mechanics of it, whether you can get your knees up like that, whether using phone books, putting your feet on the toilet seat, whatever it is, and relax. Because if you're tense, that internal sphincter is not going to contract as well. Okay, so um, pelvic floor disorders, that's another big one. Remember that the pelvic floor, the uterus, the bladder, and men, you have a pelvic floor too, right? Except you don't have uterus, fallopian tubes, ovaries. You have your bladder, your prostate gland resting on it and the bowel. So it's like a hammock and it can get stretched out and it can kind of sag. And when that happens, sometimes it's more difficult to also have a bowel movement and a pelvic floor specialist can help, biofeedback can help. There are things like anal fissures, which is like a tear in the anal lining that can make it painful to have a bowel movement and will often kind of slow things down for people. Something called a rectocele, which is like a, almost like an internal herniation in the rectum, stool can get stuck in there. So there are some sort of more technical issues to do with the rectum. If you feel like the stool is descending but not coming out, it's helpful to see somebody get a good rectal exam. We can also do a test called a defecography where we look at how the, what's happening to the stool as it's evacuated. It involves barium and an X-ray and like filming and it's, it's not the most fun test to have, but it can be incredibly useful. There's another test called a SITS marker study where you swallow these little radio opaque markers and then they x-ray sequentially over a few days to see where the markers are. If the markers are spread out throughout your whole colon, we know you have slow transit. 
sort of colonic inertia. If the markers are all down at the bottom by the rectum, we know you have obstructed defecation. You're plugged, usually with a big wad of stool, but something else, sometimes it's a motility issue. So the SITSMARC study and the defecography can be two really helpful ways to, and they're both done by the radiologist, but typically ordered by a gastroenterologist to, to help um, give us a little more specific information that can help us pinpoint the actual cause of your constipation. Another one I wanna ta talk about, we talked about, uh, we talked about holding and that's something called parcopresis. I love that word, parcopresis. And it means shy bowel. There are two words that I, the other one is coprophagia, which means eating stool. Um, and it's something that animals do, but I also think that is such a beautiful word, coprophagia and parcopresis. So shy bowel, shy bowel. I have a, I'll tell you this quick story, just two minutes. I have a patient who um, went off to summer camp when she was about 14 or 15 and she really had to have a bowel movement. They were off on some hikes. So she found an area she thought was a little clearing she went to do her business and this whole troop of Boy Scouts happened upon her in this area, literally crouching, you know, the stool coming halfway out of her and, you know, a whole bunch of teenage boys, if you can imagine, I mean, it's traumatic just thinking about it. And literally I was seeing her in her fifties and she still had issues where she literally had to have an empty house. If her kids were there, her husband was there, she could not have a bowel movement. She literally, they all had to leave the house. It had to be quiet, dark, door closed. That was the only way she could have a bowel movement. A lot of times what happens is that kids, and I think a little more girls and boys typically, will not want to go at school because, you know, the door, there may be too much space between the door and the frame and people can see, they may be concerned about the noise, the smell, et cetera. So they hold it all day. And then when they come home, guess what? They can't go because now they've been giving their internal sphincter a signal all day both they've been, the internal sphincter has not been relaxing and the external sphincter has not been pushing. And now they come home and you know they've, they have confused bowel and they can't go. And that's why it's so important for us and especially for our kids to make sure that you know when they have to go, they go because we don't want to untrain the bowel from this very natural sort of series of events that typically happen. So we talked about shy bowel, um, just being sedentary, as I've been fond of saying, if you're not moving, neither are your bowels. So you have to make sure that you are moving around. Uh, we talked about pelvic floor, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth can affect the motility in your gut. And that can be a cause of constipation. Uh, gluten intolerance is another one. Neurological conditions can cause this, like Parkinson's is frequently associated with constipation. And uh, last two, I want to talk about fibroids. So other anatomical things. If something is pressing on your bowel, like if you have large fibroid uterus, fibroids are pressing on your bowel, that can also interfere with the transit through the bowel. And lastly, something a little more ominous, colon cancer, right? I mean, it's something we don't like to consider, but it is a second leading cause of cancer deaths in both men and women who are non-smokers, so prostate in men, breast in women as number one, but if you're a non-smoker, colon cancer is number two, very preventable. So if you particularly have a change in bowel habits where all of a sudden you're very constipated and particularly, I mean, we can see it in younger people too, but particularly if you're over 45, that's something you may wanna think about. Okay, I am going to draw breath right here for a minute and see, we have lots of questions, okay. So let's go to the chat first. Happy holidays to you too. Um, tall and slim, Tiffany, yes. So your GI doctor had a hard time because you're tall and slim. I mean, good for you, but it's the only bad time to be tall and slim is during your colonoscopy. Yes, recording will be available. Give us a day or two to get it up. Somebody says, my GI person, Shirley, told me to take Miralax daily. Also my colonoscopy is described as tortuous and something else, so it couldn't be completed. So Shirley, you know, my male colleagues refer to these convoluted female colons as tortuous. And I think it's so terrible. I do not want to be told I have a tortuous colon. So that's why I call it the voluptuous venous colon. But that is what he or she was referring to when they told you that your colon was tortuous. 
Um, in terms of getting all the way through, it's important to have a complete colonoscopy. So you might want to go back and ask them if they have a pediatric colonoscope. That's what we use at Georgetown for the voluptuous venous colons is a, a thinner, more flexible scope called a pediatric colonoscope because you need to make sure for cancer screening, the entire colon has been looked at. In terms of Miralax, I don't love Miralax for daily use for the rest of your life. And here's why. Miralax is an osmotic cathartic, so it's not a stimulant laxative. So from that point of view, it's good, right? Your colon's not gonna become dependent on it, but it is essentially polyethylene glycol. It's a first cousin of antifreeze. And we just don't think over time every day that's the best thing necessarily to put into your colon. What do I like to use instead? I love a combination of a little fiber in the morning and a little magnesium at night. And the, the two fiber supplements I would think about would be psyllium husk, any brand, just make sure it doesn't have artificial sweeteners and a bunch of food coloring in it. So psyllium husk is ground up plant fiber from a plant called Plantago ovato. And it, that can really help bulk the stool and move everything through. You've got to drink it with a big glass of water, ideally one tablespoon of psyllium husk, big glass of water, second chase a glass of water after. Because it is mostly insoluble fiber, some people find that it kind of gums up in the colon and they don't tolerate it as well. In that case, I would recommend acacia fiber, which is a form of soluble fiber, and that will go through a little better. So a tablespoon of that in the morning, and then some magnesium, either something like calm magnesium, or if you want something stronger, an oxidized magnesium like oxy powder, which works really well at night. So I like that combination. Um, magnesium citrate is different from the type of magnesium we're talking about to Ashley. Um, Diana, when I take a fiber supplement, I get plugged up and do not go. Amount of discharge, very low. All extra bottom limit is staying in my colon. So my weight, oh my goodness. Oh, Diana, I'm so sorry. So here's the thing, Diana. I think the fiber supplement alone for you sounds like it's a disaster. So you can either try taking the fiber with a little Miralax for a few weeks to get things going or with some magnesium, but just don't stay on the Miralax long-term or try a different kind of fiber, like maybe the acacia fiber, the more soluble fiber, okay? Um, Shirley. Oh, you asked her to do the pediatric colonoscope, said she tried everything. Well, then in that case, you might wanna try a different gastroenterologist. And I'll tell you, I this is not a plug for academics versus private practice, but I've been on faculty at Georgetown for 24 years and I'm also in private practice. But we are a referral center at Georgetown for other gastroenterologists in the community, which means that when a gastroenterologist has a difficult time, either with a polyp or a tortuous colon, voluptuous colon, they will refer them to the university. And so generally the colonoscopies that we're doing are really challenging. And so we get good at the more difficult patients. So you might wanna ask her, depending on where you are, is there an academic center, referral center where they do more challenging colonoscopies where you might want to go? But I'm glad you have the virtual. How do I spell, is long, to, how much magnesium? Okay, um, wait, let me go to the beginning of the magnesium questions from Catherine. I have to take magnesium glycinate pills to be regular. I'd like to make an appointment to see what, we, okay. Um, We'll come back to that. How much magnesium? So it depends on what kind you're taking. For calm magnesium, most of my patients take one or two tablespoons. For the oxy powder magnesium, the dose is one to four capsules, and most people two or three capsules will do the trick. Long-term magnesium seems to be okay depending on the form you're taking it in. So the forms that I mentioned uh, are fine. I mean, we don't have any evidence of, you know, with the long-term data of any disruption there. Magnesium citrate, if you're taking a bottle of magnesium citrate, I would not take that long term because that is quite uh, aggressive and that can actually make you quite dehydrated and throw off your electrolyte balance. The kind of fiber, I'm going to spell it for you, Diana. Psyllium is P-S-Y-L-L-I-U-M and acacia is A-C-A-C-I-A, -A -A, acacia, okay? Um, Citrusella is great. If it works for you, I have no concerns about Citrusella, Sharon, if it's working for you. Traumatic births can cause pudendal nerve damage. Can this also affect colonic evacuation? Absolutely. Thank you so much for pointing that out. Um, the nerve damage 
you can see that with a forceps delivery, you can see it, you know, with a traumatic vaginal birth, that nerve damage. Usually though, what we see in that situation is more issues with incontinence than constipation, but it can go either way, depending on the nerve damage and a really good biofeedback practitioner. I have to give a shout out to Thrive again, who are the biofeedback folks that I refer my patients to here in the Washington DC area. They're amazing. They do internal biofeedback and they really work with my patients with pelvic floor disorders. So I have patients who have, we missed a big category called anismus, which is sort of in that pelvic floor disorder arena of anismus, where basically there is there is a sort of lack of coordination between all the muscular things that are supposed to happen. And sometimes what's going on with anismus is there's a bit of clenching. It can be involuntary. The person doesn't know that they have their, that they're clenching and their internal sphincter can't relax. And so what a good internal biofeedback practitioner can do is do some breathing exercises with you. And they can have a catheter and monitoring you so that they can feel when you're squeezing and get you to relax and then create that association with what does that feel like now when you're relaxed and the stool can go through. So I have to tell you, they're a huge, huge help in my practice, particularly for the folks with pelvic floor disorders, anismus, et cetera. Um, uh, protocol for voluptuous colon, trap gas. Carrie, I'm so glad that you mentioned trap gas because Bloating and constipation are fellow travelers. Just think about it. It is one long tube. If you are plugged at the bottom with a big wad of stool, everything on top is going to pile up. And the stool on top of that is going to get fermented and fermented and fermented some more by gut bacteria. And you're gonna have a whole lot of gas. So normally we pass about a liter of gas through our rectums without thinking about it. And here's the analogy I wanna tell you about. I'm breathing right now, but I'm not really thinking about breathing, but then I can go, and I just took a big breath, right? So a fart is like a big breath. That's, a, that's an intentional expulsion. But the liter of gas that you're passing during the day without thinking about it is like the breathing. It's just happening. When you are plugged, that breath, <laughs> of the rectal breath of the normal gas exchange is not happening and it's all piling up, okay? And so bloating, which when we talk about bloating, it can be liquid solid or air, gas. But when we talk about bloating, we're usually talking about this excess gas that's trapped in our abdominal area. And one of the commonest reasons is just because you're plugged down below and that gas can't come out. So if you really want to solve bloating, you have to solve constipation. And I would say well over 50%, anywhere from 60 to 70% of the patients I see who complain of bloating, the main underlying problem is incomplete evacuation. Sometimes they don't realize they're constipated. When I ask them, they say, oh no, I go every day. But it's not complete. When I ask them about, you know, are you having a clean wipe? When I ask them how they feel, do you have that sense of relief? Is it a large stool? Do you feel like you're emptying completely? The answer is no. And so they're having incomplete emptying. And here's what I want you to think about. If you go every day, but you only evacuate 90% and you leave 10% behind, that means about every 10 days, you have a full of stool colon, right? And so this is often what's happening with people. And then again, the stool is being fermented and the gas is not coming out. Okay. Um, I always, MSC, I always had a slower than usual bowel since childhood. I'm 45, but recently started worrying a lot. I never empty fully. Happy if I go to the washroom twice a week. No, no, we have to fix this. Twice a week is not enough. Unless you tell me you're eating twice a week, you're eating every day, right? I eat plant-based, move every day, drink tons of water, still not sure what is causing me to be constipated throughout my life. Any suggestion is much appreciated. Thank you. Okay, so here's the thing. There's a natural range for transit times, right? Just like there's a natural rate range for height. Some people are 4'11", some people are 6'11", and it doesn't make the 4'11 person sick or the 6'11 person abnormal. There is a range. There is also a range for transit time just like metabolism, some people have a slower transit time, but twice a week is definitely not enough. So I want you to think again about the basics, right? Are you drinking 100 ounces of water? Are you eating, measure your fiber, check, you know, write it down, see if you can get up to 50 grams of fiber, and are you moving around? If, these, if you're doing these things and you're not taking any medications that are a problem, 
I really think you need to get this investigated. So think about getting your thyroid function checked to make sure that, you know, there's not some underlying thyroid condition. Um, think about having somebody check things out anatomically to make sure something's not pressing. And, you know, if this has really been since childhood and it's not a significant change, I would really think about something you could do to speed it up. Now, the drugs to increase motility are not great. They mostly act on the stomach, first of all. So they're not super helpful in the colon. And a lot of them cross the blood brain barrier and have neurological side effects that are uh, not so good. But here are a couple of natural things that work. Ginger is an amazing natural motility agent. So one of my favorite things is a ginger fennel tea. Chop up some ginger, chop up some fennel, hot water, steep it. You can make a huge container of it and drink that. So ginger fennel tea. Aloe is another great thing. Aloe vera can be really helpful for helping to um, speed motility up. So I want you to think about some of those more natural things in addition to the supplements like the magnesium we talked about. And definitely get that checked out. Um, the kind of magnesium I'm recommending, oxy powder, O-X-Y-P-O-W-D-E-R, or really oxidized magnesium. Barb is sharing, I had a lot of antibiotics as a kid and have been doing the things that I'm recommending. Um, if I don't take magnesium and a lot of fiber or trifala, trifala is another thing that can be very helpful, T-R-I-P-H-A-L-A. Um, I return to being constipated. Can people recover from a lot of antibiotics? You can, Barb. Again, this is, you know, what I spend a lot of time in my practice doing, but it really depends, you know, and it depends where you a C-section baby, where you nursed or not, was a lot of the antibiotics early in your first, you know, three to five years of life, or really even in your first 18 years of life, when the microbiome is still forming, were you on other medications like acid blockers, non-steroidal steroids, et cetera, that could have also messed up your microbiome? What kind of diet were you eating? You know, were you a bit of a picky eater in childhood? So all of those things go into the equation of dysbiosis of an altered gut microbiome. Everybody's microbiome can be improved. Everybody's, but not everybody's microbiome can become normal, right? So improvement, it doesn't necessarily need to be normal. So I, you know, I think those things you're taking, the magnesium and the trifala and a high fiber diet are fine. I think those things are all, you know, not harmful things, but I would continue to really work on your microbiome, fermented foods, lots of cabbage, sauerkraut, all of that stuff, and see if you can, if you can work on it that way too, to try and mitigate the effects of the antibiotics. Calm Magnesium, Debbie, is a, just a kind of magnesium. It's a brand, really, of magnesium. It's quite gentle. Um, the recordings of these office hours are on, if you go to digestivecenterforwellness.com, click on office hours on the page, and you'll see the upcoming office hours, and then you'll also see the archived office hours down below. We usually take a day or two to get it up there. Um, and that's for you too, Shirley. Uh, and also on the website, YouTube channel. Thank you, Tiffany. My system seems unable to tolerate fiber. Psyllium gives me runs and acacia makes me go too many times with yucky, soft, gummy stuff. High fiber foods make painful, hard, large, large, hard bowel movement. So here's the thing. So, and I'm glad you pointed out that, that out, Joe. Psyllium is really good for constipation, but we also use psyllium for diarrhea too, because it can help consolidate stool. So it sounds like the fiber is just making it too plentiful for you. Um, and I would think instead of the kind of cruciferous vegetables, um, high residue fiber, I would try more sweet potato, pumpkin, squash, that kind of fiber. We actually use pumpkin and dogs for diarrhea. It works great. So see if you could switch up the fiber and incorporate more of that. And again, my three recommendations are pumpkin, squash, sweet potato to see if that can even you out. Okay, what about problems with hemorrhoids and scar tissue accumulation? So Jill, hemorrhoids are really just dilated veins. So here's the thing, everybody has veins in the rectal area, right? But when those veins become engorged with blood, now we call them hemorrhoids, but the veins are always there. And why do they become engorged with blood? Because we're pushing, we're straining to get that stool out. And so now you have a hemorrhoid. So just treating the hemorrhoids, I do a bunch of procedures for hemorrhoids. I do this banding procedure where we suck the hemorrhoid into the scope and a band gets released and it shrinks the hemorrhoid. But I never want to just treat the hemorrhoid because if you're not addressing the underlying cause of why you have a hemorrhoid in the first place, 
they're going to come back. Okay, so hemorrhoids are a direct result of straining. Your colon is pushing too hard, and it's usually pushing to push out a small, hard, stingy stool. So that's why bulking the stool, either with more fiber in your diet and or a fiber supplement, can be so helpful for the hemorrhoids. Um, and, and hemorrhoids can shrink down. So it's not like once you have the hemorrhoid, it's there for life. The hemorrhoids, as as the stool becomes bulkier and just drops more effortlessly into the bowl, as you approach stool nirvana, you, your colon won't need to push as much and the hemorrhoids can generally shrink down as the veins become less engorged. And that should be the goal. How much fennel in the ginger fennel to tea, whatever it's on the gutless site, but there's no, you know, I usually use about two inches worth of ginger and I'll use an entire fennel bulb and just chop it up. So it's not like you can put too much and it's, it's going to go wrong. So I would, I would use, you know, again, a couple inches worth of fresh ginger, peel it, chop it up and a whole fennel bulb. Um, thank you, Margo. It's fine to do the acacia in the AM and the oxidized magnesium in the PM over long periods of time. I use that in my patients and that is an absolutely fine combination. Um, motegrity long-term. So motegrity is a pro-motility drug and I don't love these drugs in the long-term. I think for short periods of time, six to eight weeks are fine. There are some people who have serious motility disorders who need them, but I would say, Don, if you can get off the motegrity, I would try. All right, so that was the chat. Let's go to the Q&A. I forgot all about the Q&A. Okay. Um, and then Tiffany, I think we talked about this, right? What is considered regular? Hi, Sarah. Um, noticing some slowdown in transit time more constipated feeling, want to go, but don't have the urge as I eat less fruit and more cooked fruit, like brown rice, sweet potatoes. When I was eating mostly all fruit diet, I had nicely formed bowel movement. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I understand you're making some transition, Sarah. So, but think about other things that bulk that may not be fruit. I don't know if you're eating legumes, but lentils, split peas, those are great for bulking. And then the advice I gave somebody a minute ago about squash, sweet potatoes, stuff like that should be really helpful for bulking. Does getting calcium from supplements based on plants reduce the constipation? No, calcium is constipating regardless of the source. Typically, it may not be constipating for you, Jean, but in general, calcium is something that can be constipating. Colonics and coffee enemas. I'm so glad you asked, Monica. Here's the thing. The gut isn't dirty, so it doesn't need cleaning. If you are doing what you need to be doing, enough fiber, enough water, enough movement, your colon is it's like a self-cleaning oven. It will be eliminating on its own. The problem with an enema is this sort of negative biofeedback. So particularly the positive pressure enemas is the colon, you know, you use this positive pressure to sort of pull everything out of the colon and sort of like a stimulant laxative, then the colon is like, oh, I don't have to do anything. The work is being done for me and you beca can become very dependent on, um, on these enemas. So I, on these colonics. So I don't love the idea of regular colonics and the same thing for coffee enemas, you know, Basti enemas and enemas with licorice and different things like that. It can, you know, it's a very delicate ecosystem in there. And as I've discussed before, the healthy bacteria, the Fecalobacterium prosnitzii and the Eubacterium rectalis and all these really important um, bacterial species that are involved in fermenting the fiber and creating these healthy, life-saving short-chain fatty acids that give us our immune balance and a healthy gut, you can wash them all out with it, some of this stuff and you can kill them with a lot of stuff you're putting in there. So what I recommend instead, if you are somebody who was thinking about a colonic, think about doing it from above. Think about just doing a juice fast for a day. If you feel like you're very clogged and you wanna, you know, you'd like to clean things out instead of putting something in there and washing it out, think about just really hydrating your body from the mouth and seeing if you can get a similar effect. Yes, Holly, the recording will be available. Um, Tiffany, what a great, you're full of great questions. For those of us that work in a large office, is there a way to train yourself to have a bowel movement every morning before work? This is a thing I want to tell you. There's no human being out there that does not have a bowel movement. It is like breathing. And so while it can be helpful to train yourself, and I'll tell you a funny story about that in a minute and how that can go wrong, maybe TMI, but I'm going to share it with you. I feel like I'm amongst friends. Um, 
you also like stride into that bathroom, claim your stall and just go for it and go for it and walk out, you know, head held high, wash your hands and just let people deal with it. Okay. I'm not sure I'm ready to do that in the co-ed bathroom yet, but, um, but for sure, you know, uh, you just need to go. But here's the thing about training yourself to go earlier. A couple of weeks ago, it was a week before Thanksgiving, my husband and I went to Philadelphia to run the Philadelphia half marathon. And the start time was 7 a.m. And we had to really get out there about 6.30 because of the COVID protocol and everything. We needed a little extra time. And I was all about making sure that I did not have to use a bathroom, not have to have a bowel movement. I usually go in the morning, but like around seven-ish, which was right when the race started. So I took some oxy powder. I normally don't take anything, but I've taken it before. And I decided to take the oxy powder on the drive to Philadelphia. So it's one o'clock, we're leaving for Philadelphia. My husband sees me taking four oxy powder. And he looks at me and he goes, are you sure that's a good idea? And I got all, you know, I am a, I am a renowned gastroenterologist. How dare you question me? I treat thousands of patients with constipation. Of course, I know what I'm doing. How dare you question me? <laughs> Not quite that bad, but I got pretty on my high horse about, of course, I know what I'm doing. Well, the truth is I'd never taken oxy powder at one o'clock in the day before. The rare occasions I do take it, I take it at night before I go to bed, like at 10 o'clock. But I'm thinking... I got to take it a little bit early. So of course we get to the hotel in Philadelphia and we're staying at this great hotel, right? It's one block from the course start and we get to the hotel and from like six o'clock to nine o'clock, I'm in the bathroom, right? Like I'm just going and going and going. Cause I also made up like about, let's see, about 40 ounces of green smoothie. So I'm driving to Philadelphia, I've taken my oxy powder and I'm now drinking 40 ounces of green smoothie of, you know, kale and celery and, and spinach. And I'm drinking that and all hell broke loose in the hotel room. So it was, um, it was a very eventful night before the race. So you might have to finesse it a little bit. I think the combination of the green smoothie and the oxy powder at one o'clock was just too much. So you will have to play around, Tiffany, to see like what is the ideal timing of stuff for you. Um, huge fan of the green smoothie for those of you who are constipated and you can find that at Gopless too if you type in green smoothie. But um, you may need to do, I always recommend fiber in the morning because it needs time to make its way down through your digestive tract into the colon and that's best done with the help of gravity and being upright and movement. So you don't wanna take fiber at night typically, but you may have to play around. If you're taking psyllium husk in the morning and you're not having a bowel movement before work, you know, you may wanna play around with what time you take it. Do you add a little magnesium to help? And then just the training, like get in the habit of going into the bathroom and sitting down on the pot in the morning, you know, every morning, it's like Pavlov's dog, eventually things should start to happen. Okay, um, how to address colonic inertia from overuse of laxatives? Well, the first thing is that you've got to stop the laxatives. And this is a, this is a problem I see frequently in my practice. I see people who come in who are addicted to laxatives. So we will work out a long weaning program. I mean, it's almost like tapering off a steroid or off a narcotic is you just have to gradually decrease the amount. But as you gradually decrease the amount, you have to increase something else, right? Otherwise you're gonna be having no bowel movement. I mean, if you've really been taking a lot of laxatives and you have severe colonic inertia, we have to substitute something else for that laxative. So the something else that I usually will substitute is again, my combination of fiber. In the case of colonic inertia from laxatives, I will often use Miralax because you need something stronger. And I'll often use just little bits of fiber because typically with colonic inertia, if you do a tablespoon of psyllium husk fiber, it's just gonna sit there, it's not moving through. So my protocol would typically be a teaspoon of fiber with each meal, teaspoon at breakfast, teaspoon at lunch, teaspoon at dinner, and then some Miralax at night. And just gradually, you know, as you decrease the laxative, you increase that other stuff. And then, you know, ideally you get back to sort of a, a normal state, right? Where the colon has regained its functionality and its um, peristaltic, peristaltic movement. 
Marilyn, yes, bananas are constipating, but if you're not constipated, have them and enjoy them, you know? But if you are constipated, it's something to consider maybe having less of. So bananas are something we use as part of our BRAT protocol, B-R-A-T, bananas, rice, applesauce, and tea. Usually people are having diarrhea to kind of, you know, pull everything together. So they can be constipating. Most people, they're not terribly constipating, but they're neutral. They're not a high fiber fruit, like an apple, for example. How are fibroids diagnosed? Likely with a slender, bloated, constipated senior woman with a floppy colon. That is, a, that is an interesting description. Fibroids are diagnosed usually with an ultrasound. A pelvic ultrasound is usually how they see them. So it's a non-invasive test that your OBGYN can order. What, it is, what is a twisted bowel and what can be done about it? So, uh, you know, the bowel is tethered to the abdominal wall by something called a mesentery. And it's... Um, it's like a ribbon of tissue, right? So you have the colon, which is a tube. You have these 30 feet of intestines from the esophagus all the way down to the anus, but it's not just loose in there. It's tethered to the abdominal wall with this ribbon. Think of it like a kind of satin ribbon, right? And in the mesentery is where the lymph nodes are and the blood vessels are that feed the bowel. And that's also tethering it, holding it somewhat in place. But of course it can move around. What can happen is that it can twist on the mesentery. And a full colon is more likely to twist. So if you're constipated, you're having incomplete evacuation, you're more likely to get that twisting. Brown flaxseed, okay, absolutely. You use it a lot. Good for you, Lisa. It's absolutely fine. Um, after I hit a hysterectomy, I've had more difficulty evacuating my bowel completely. Any suggestions? So that is likely due to scar tissue from the hysterectomy. And the first thing I would do is I would go to see your OBGYN if you haven't recently, have them do a good pelvic exam. It should be a bi-manual exam where they're basically inserting a finger into the your rectum and your vagina at the same time because they can feel that space in between and feel if there's scar tissue. So a good bimanual exam, it sounds awful, but if the person who's doing it knows what they're doing, it's really not terrible and it can give a lot of information and a pelvic ultrasound, that combination can help them to see if structurally there's something going on. And then beyond that, if it looks like there's not like an immense amount of scarring or something actually obstructing, then a lot of the other information that I gave about fiber, magnesium, et cetera, that stuff can be helpful. What do I recommend doing for rectocele? Is splinting okay? Also, is it magnesium citrate that we should take? So again, remember I told you a rectocele is sort of like a bulge. Um, we can see it after pregnancy, especially with a vaginal delivery, large birth weight baby, but anybody can develop a rectocele. So it's like an outpouching, or really an in-pouching because it's internally, um, you know, in the rectum and sigmoid area and stool gets stuck in it. Some people have to digitate, they have to put a finger in to try and press on the stool to get it to empty down into the main colon. It can be surgically repaired, but before you think about the surgical repair, I would highly recommend that you try to get in with a good biofeedback practitioner and see if they can give you some, um, some helpful suggestions for how to get more complete emptying with the pelvic floor despite having the rectocele. Uh, somebody, Carolyn says, I don't have constipation by my definition, but have changes in nature of stool that seem to be associated with bloating. Whole food plant-based diet mostly. Um, occasionally I have what I, two very normal bowel movements per day and all is good, a lot of bloating. But Okay, so if you're having narrow bowel movements that are harder to pass, or if you're having little pellets, and particularly if you're over 45, you may have diverticulosis. And we have a diverticulosis office hours coming up, which is gonna be great in January. Check out the January schedule. Um, on January 11th, in honor of my birthday, we're having um, origins of the microbiome. Where do we get our microbes from? We have a diverticulosis coming up that month. And then we moved belly fat or bloated from next week, because I'm gonna be away to January 4th. So we have some good stuff coming up in January. but. Carolyn, what you're describing makes me think you could have diverticulosis, which are these potholes in the colon. So typical diverticulosis is multiple bowel movements because they're not all emptying, small bowel movements or thin bowel movements. So check out that, sign up for that diverticulosis one so we can talk more about it. Now, I don't know if that's what you have because again, I have to remind you, I'm not giving you medical advice just giving you some education here. So none of this stuff should be stuff that you're acting on without the supervision of your healthcare provider. But it may be helpful for you to get more information. And then if it sounds like that's what you may have, certainly talk to your 
physician or healthcare provider about that. Okay, but this, the shape of the stool is very significant because again, little pellets can suggest diverticulosis. Thin ribbons could be diverticulosis, could be colon cancer, could be you know spasm, lots of different things, not all of them terrible. Um, my GI doc suggested Senna as a trial. Yeah, not a good idea. Said it would not be addictive. Senna is the ultimate stimulant laxative and it is habit forming. So when you say addictive, not like you crave it, but your colon doesn't function as well without it. Um, so you're doing some Senna tea right now. There's one called Smooth Move and it works fabulously. But again, the problem is that you have to take more and more and more of it. And if you stop taking it, your bowels stop moving. So uh, yeah, I would not, definitely not recommend taking that long-term. Hypothyroid, taking Synthroid, would this balance out the tendency of constipation? Yes, it should, Marilyn. It should um, help with that because that if, you're, if your constipation is a result of your hypothyroidism and not something else. Had a colonoscopy summer 2020, told I had a polyp, requires me to have more frequent colonoscopies. Anything I can do to prevent concerning polyps? Yes, absolutely. Hot off the press. It was just on my feed this morning. Um, I see if I can find it. Uh, let's see. Um, about, here it is. Okay. Mounting data link red meat consumption to colorectal cancer risk mortality. This is not new, friends. We've known this for a long time, but there's just more evidence now. So this is an article where researchers identified a possible molecular link between high consumption of both processed and unprocessed red meat and increased colorectal cancer risk and mortality. And it goes on to say, we have known for quite a while now that environmental factors, including diet, can impact colorectal cancer incidence. What was missing were data demonstrating whether we could see an impact of these environmental carcinogens in cancer specimens. So they're actually seeing a modification in the gene. And this research adds to lines of evidence connecting high consumption of red meat. So yes, Polyps, there's a genetic basis for that, but there's a huge environmental basis. Less, not just red meat, less animal protein, more plants. It doesn't mean you have to go vegan, but you want to decrease the amount of animal products and increase the amount of plants. And ideally, your next colonoscopy, you will have fewer or zero polyps. That should be the goal. Good luck. Um, yes, Jason, please sign up. Drug-free IBD. Go to digestivecenterforwellness.com. All one word, digestive center for for wellness.com go to courses you see drug free ibd we would love to have you i think you might be the person in medical school i'm not sure but whoever you are we would love to have you um do i have a book that offers a plant-based diet and healthy smoothies we can adopt um i have three books i have gut bliss i have the microbiome solution i have the bloat cure and i have a fourth book the antiviral gut coming out next summer which is proving much more difficult to write than all three books combined. Um, and so my book, Gut Bliss, would be a good first one for you. It's not specifically a, a whole foods plant-based diet. Mostly, I would say 90% of the recipes are, and there's some good smoothies in there. But you know, if you just look online, I think there's so many options too with the recipes for that stuff. Um, so my book has some really good stuff and some smoothies, but it's not just recipes and smoothies. Uh, my doctor recommends 1200 milligrams of calcium, how to take this best to not stop me up. So calcium for bones. Yes, but here's the thing, Diana, it turns out that green leafy vegetables, small bone fish like salmon and sardine and weight bearing exercise are vastly superior to calcium. And here's the other crazy thing, your doctor may not be aware of that. So I would look that up and see, and then take that to your doctor, because that recommendation is based on old data, likely, right? But again, I'm not telling you to stop the calcium. I'm just telling you to look up those recommendations about green leafy vegetables, small bone fish, and weight bearing exercise for bones, and discuss them with your doctor. Um, thought on bone broth, you know, if you're super constipated and plugged in, you're just trying to evacuate, you know, some bone broth could be helpful for that. But, um, you know, any sort of hydration is going to be helpful generally in that setting. Um, what if a person needs to take calcium and magnesium for osteoporosis, how to mitigate any constipating effects. So um, again, doing a little more magnesium in that situation may be helpful. 
My husband has diverticulosis. Hi, Jane. And has been using Miralax long-term. What do you advise? Yeah, Metamucil would be a much better option, Jane, for him. So I'd recommend getting into the psyllium husk, but make sure it's not a Metamucil with artificial sweetener or food coloring. And it doesn't have to be Metamucil brand. I just say that because you asked about that brand. So have him do a tablespoon of psyllium husk in a big glass of water with a second glass of water after every morning, and then only use a Miralax if he's not going. Um, like if he doesn't have a bowel movement that day, then use a little Miralax at night and see if he can wean off the Miralax that way, or just use it as needed. So Miralax once a week is better than Miralax every day, right? And obviously increase the fiber in his diet. Um, uh, yes, the so magnesium twice a day is okay. Just make sure, Emma, you're staying within the recommended dose. Okay, let's see. Um, can I comment on my upcoming class? I would be happy to. So, you know, we're launching these courses and you guys are, you know, you're like our guinea pigs, right? We're beta testing. We're seeing like what format works. So for the drug-free IBD and the SIBO course, those are four week courses, quite intense with a big workbook and a lesson every week and then a live Q&A with me every week. And that's because inflammatory bowel disease and SIBO really require a really thorough understanding to get in there and, and make sure you understand what's going on and, and how to resolve things and get to a better state of health. We also have a one day course that's gonna be the third week of January called Getting Regular. And it's gonna be a lot of this stuff, but with more information. So a lot of the stuff I'm talking about, you know, it's all gonna be in the workbook, the protocols, et cetera. Um, so there will be discussion, but I think the point of that is to actually give you in a printed way that you can, well, printed, a digital ebook that you can reference. So for example, the amount of fiber in the different foods, the different, you know, what's the hierarchy of things you should be using, et cetera. So some of the protocols. So that's just one day and that's third week of January. So please join us for that one too. Um, let's see. Oh my goodness. We're like nine minutes past. There's so much stuff we're going to have to do. You know, we're going to have to do uh, getting regular number two that uh, we're just going to have to do it because I can tell that you guys like me could talk about this stuff all day, right? There is like, literally we could take any one of these topics and talk about it all day. But I do, I do want to go because I want to be respectful of people's time. This will be up on the website. Um, I will not see you guys till the new year. I just want to tell everybody, you know, be safe out there. It's um, things are ramping up as you know, so be safe, be healthy. And don't forget your dirt, sweat, veg. Get out in nature, get sweaty, and eat some vegetables. I've already gotten my sweat this morning because I worked out inside, but I didn't get my dirt. I'm going to go try and play tennis with my dad. My poor dad, he's almost 87, and he does not like the cold. And I spoke to him this morning, and he's like, well, you know, it's 32 degrees because we play outside. I said, yeah, but it's going to be 44 by, by 3 o'clock when I'm done with work. So come join me. So I'll see if I can drag my dad out for some tennis. And then I'm going to go have a big salad for lunch. So get your dirt, sweat, veg and, uh, you know, shoot me a message on Instagram or something and tell me how you're getting your dirt, sweat, veg. I would love to hear about it. Have a wonderful holiday season, everybody. I cannot tell you how much these hour sessions mean to me. I love them. I love your questions. I wish I could see your faces and it's so wonderful being a part of this community with you. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.